Welcome back to our program, Hollywood Structured. As some of you already know, our program is designed to help the young people who wish to enter the entertainment field, maybe music, nightclub work, theater, television, or film. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people to help them understand their wants and their needs and the pitfalls and the traps they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. Today, as our special guest, we have someone who wanted desperately to become a dancer. She studied, as a matter of fact, for over seven years, but decided that she had to study something else if she wanted to have a profession that would provide her enough money to sustain herself. So she started studying nursing. However, she never became a nurse. She became a stunt woman, very well known, with over 30 films and over 40 movie credits. She has doubled such people as Jane Kennedy, Cecilia Tyson, Pam Greer, Whoopi Goldberg, and many, many more. Her name is J.D. David. Hello, J.D. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Before J.D. share her experiences and her troubles with her, with us, I would like to speak to you today about something that has been in the papers and that is very, very controversial at the moment. There are ads in regular newspapers that advertise for, we need new faces for um, modeling, for print work, and no experience necessary. You understand? And they have a phone number. Now, you're a young actor, you're a young actress, and you need an opening, and you think, well, maybe if I do some print work, I will, be, I will be seen. If I do some modeling, I will be seen. And that will be a door opening for me in acting. So you answer the ad, and they make an appointment for you. And when uh, they make the appointment for you, you go to the appointment, and they ask to see a portfolio or some pictures of yourself. Now, if you have some pictures, and you're usually very proud of them, you show it to them, and they look at them and they say, well, they are not bad, but they're not exactly what we're looking for. Um, you look very good. I mean, you certainly are a very good prospect, but we can't work with those pictures. And you say, well, what should I do? So they say, well, you should have other pictures. We have a photographer, actually, that we can recommend who will take pictures of you for your portfolio. And then we can see if we can handle you. Well. You're eager, you're hungry, you want to be in the limelight. So you say, well, how much is it going to cost me? And they will say a price like three or $400. Now, if you have the money and if you pay for that, needless to say that half of the money goes to the photographer and half of the money goes to the advertiser, who are supposedly producer. If you don't have the money and you tell them that you do not have the money, they will say, well, let's talk. And they will ask you all sorts of questions. They will make sure that you're from out of town. They will make sure that you're not an undercover vice officer. And if you are not any of these things, then they will suggest the photographer. They will give you the name. They will say, when you go there, you will have to pose for him for certain photographs and then he'll take several shots of you, and you can use those shots. This will be the way you pay him back. So you go there and to the appointment, and they have clothes for you. And those clothes are usually very skimpy to start with. And pretty soon they'll ask you to pose semi-nude. And before you know it, you will be posing New. They will say, well, you know, Playboy, Centerfold, etc., etc. Your picture will be in all the magazines. Now, you may not like what you're doing, but you're thinking, well, I'm going to have some pictures of myself. Good. Then I can do something else. 
Now, you know what can happen to you. Before you know it, you can be working in porno film. Is that what you want? So when you see an ad in the paper, make sure that it is legitimate. Make sure that they are not trying to buy you and your body for nothing. Okay? Let's go back to our guest. J.D., where were you born? Mm, Los Angeles. You were? Yeah. You're a native? A native Los Angeles. Unbelievable. There are very few people born from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Now, you studied dancing, right? Yeah, I did. I wanted very much to be a dancer. There, were you good? Um, I was okay. I wasn't that good a dancer as I am a stunt person. <laughs> yes, but you, you didn't know you were going to be a stunt person no, then. Not at all. Right? Uh, now, did the fact that you were always tall, was it good or bad for dancing? Um, actually, in my opinion, I felt it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was good for me because my body was long and it was expressive and it was like out there and there was more of me to see. <laughs> <laughs> I see. But then what decided you to study nursing? Um, a practical job. Something that I could like, where it was solid and just a practical job. I mean, to pay for your rent and so forth. Yeah, pay my bills. Yeah. Now, at that point, studying nursing, you certainly had no idea you would ever become a stunt woman. Did you ever know what it was? No, I had no ambitions of being a stunt woman. I was um, riding my horse in Griffith Park, and there was a gentleman that used to ride um, along the trails with me, and. Um, he used to ride up and say, well, you know, I'm going to put you in the movies. And I'm going, oh, Christ. I'm <laughs> Can you scared. believe that <laughs> kind of line? <laughs> yeah. um, and one day, he called me up and asked me to fly to Arizona and do some horseback riding and swimming and diving, doubling um, Denise Nichols on a movie. And um, they gave me a first-class plane ticket, first-class accommodations, and paid me to do something that was just darn fun to do. And I thought, this was great. So I'm Hmm? That gentleman was legitimate. Yeah, he was absolutely legitimate. His name was Bob Miner, and he's a, uh, a quite successful second unit director and stunt coordinator now, yes. I see. Now, you knew how to ride horse. Yes. You knew how to swim. Yes. Now, the thing that they ask you to do on that first picture, do you feel you were qualified because you were trained almost as an athlete, or did you have to learn on the job? On that, one. Um, on that particular picture, the reason why I was chosen was because of my physical stature. They needed um, a tall uh, black or African American woman um, to double Denise, and I had the abilities that they needed. Um, as my career went on, a lot of my training was on the job training, but I had a good solid foundation and was able to pick up a lot of um, physical things quite quickly. So that's about how it happened. And so this was your first, first job? Yes. Now, what are the thoughts in your mind about nursing, about having a regular job, now that you have encountered a career that you never counted on? Well, as a young person, I, I, my thoughts were, I, I'm out of school here. I mean, I'm getting paid big dollars to, to do things that I just enjoy on my own. And so my, 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 my first thoughts was, oh, this is great. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm on my way to be a movie star. A movie star? Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. Now, what did your family think of that? Um, my family, they were, they were pretty much supportive. They were a little disappointed that I didn't stay in school. I mean, naturally, all parents want their children to finish school. They were a little disappointed. But if it was what I really wanted and it made me happy, they were, they were supportive. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. That's very nice. So that was your first experience, and all of it was very, very positive. Very positive. Okay. Now, you brought me some photographs that I would like to share with, with our friends out there. And some of, the, some of the photographs are blurry because of the kind of work that JD does, which is falling downstairs, crashing through windows, uh, jumping from roller coaster. And so I would like to show you this one, which is a staircase fall. If you, Rick, can you get on this one? And you were doubling uh, Pam Greer on this one, right? 
Yes, yeah, I was doubling for pain. Now, here. when you do those, and your head is down here, right? Yeah. Um, when you do these, are you padded? Are you... Yeah, you're pretty much padded. Um, stair falls are one of those things where you just kind of like are a passenger. I mean, you try to get into the best possible position you can get into to start the stair fall, but the rest of the stair fall, you're just pretty much a passenger, so you just take it as it comes. What do you mean, a passenger? Um, once you start the fall, you have very little control after you start rolling down the stairs. I, so, I mean, you're just a victim of, well, victim's probably not a good <laughs> word, <laughs> but um, you are just, um, you know, a passenger of how the momentum takes you down the stairs. Now, you never had staircase fall before. How do you train for that? Or do you train just to fall to start with, um, with one step, two steps? Well, no, I mean, um, the, the, the one thing that, I, um, that was good for me was that I studied dance. So I had a good um, uh, discipline of my body. I had a good control over my body. So, um, I mean, I would, the first stair fall I had, they just said, fall down the stairs. And luckily, I mean, I had, a, I had good control of my body, so when I fell down the stairs, I didn't break everything, every bone in my body. <laughs> But um, yeah, it was just like go for but it. But you are padded, right? You pad it. You pad it very well. There's, yeah. you know, you pad your your elbows, your knees, your spine, mm -hmm. um, your hips. You can be anything you can possibly get away. Padding, you pad. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, you can't pad yourself for this. This is a picture of you on fire, actually playing yourself, right? Yes. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, let me put this to Rick so Rick can pick it up. Uh, can you explain to the audience over there how you do that? Now, this is you totally on fire. Look at this. Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple ways that we do fire burns. Um, you're generally wearing, well, no, not uh, protective clothing on mm -hmm. your body. Yeah. Um, on, on your face, on your head. Um, you can either do it two ways, depending on probably the, the, the heat of the fire and the amount of flames. You can either go with just a gel that was developed, a fire protected gel that you can just put on your face and then you wig yourself. And you put mean the like, gel like, on a, like a Vaseline? Is it like a mask? Yeah, well, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's a, a Vaseline, but yeah, it's like a jelly kind of stuff that you just put all over you and um, it prevents you from burning. And that particular um, shot right there, I well, did have me, on let a. Let me complete put it on camera again. Okay. Okay, in that particular shot, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I did have a complete. Um, um, headgear on and everything because yeah, this is not a great shot for it but actually the flame was huge for most of the time and the heat of that flame dictated having to wear complete headgear. I see. And, and it cannot be seen uh, in the fire? No, what the fire is, yeah, right. It, and, but, but over the headgear, you know, they put a little face on you and a little makeup and you got a little oh, hair. Oh, I see. So it's, it's yeah. a little fake yeah. on top of what you, the On protecting. top of the mask, yes. Ooh. Better you than yeah. I. <laughs> All right. Then we have another picture here from the boy next door with Marty Sheen in which uh, you go through a plate glass window, right? Yes. Um, this is old glass shattering around you. Now, would you explain to the people out there the kind of glass that they use now? Because they used to use candy, yes. I mean sugar candy. Yeah. And now they use another form of uh, glass. Um, it's just like, it's glass, just like the glass in the windshield of your car. Yes. And um, what um, special effects does is they run little wires in specific parts of the glass. And as you, the performer, approach the glass, special effects um, sets the glass off so it starts to shatter. And just as you come to the glass, the glass shatters, like in the windshield of your car, if you, if you hit the windshield of your car, and you push the glass through. Oh, you mean they manipulate it from, all, from outside yes. here? Yes. Ooh, I see. So this is what, in, in this picture, this is actually what happened? Yes. This, this is the, 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 the kind glass. of glass, this is the kind of glass that shatters, like on the, on the, on the car, yes. right? Absolutely. Ooh, interesting. Now, I have another picture that uh, I want to talk about because <laughs> this is also going through glass with uh, Bill Cosby in Leonard Part 6. And you are 
crushing. There is a horse right here, and there is Bill Cosby. Uh, supposedly, Bill Cosby, but it's a stunt man, right? It's a stunt double, yes. And you are in back of him. Yes. Now, in this picture, you, yeah, you can see the horse, and you can see the two of you. You're crashing through a window, a window plate. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. Now, please explain what happened. You did it twice? Well, we did it twice. Um, the first time we did it, um, I suppose it was the director who decided that he wanted a different angle mm -hmm. on the shot. So we went back and did it the second time. The first time, um, it was difficult getting the horse through anyway. I mean, horses just like freak out at that Spook. kind of thing. But um, we did it, we got the shot, and he wanted a second shot. The second shot, they reset the glass in the framing of the window. The glass was mismarked by the glass company. Oh, no. And they put actual sheet glass into the, the framing of the window. So when you mean like, like our regular windows? Yeah, just like a regular window. Um, so when we went through the window, um, the... I remember going through the window, and this was like real freaky for me because I know what the glass is supposed to look like when it crumples alongside of you, but to see these huge sheets of glass falling. falling all around you was really like kind of a freaky situation. The poor horse got cut to smithereens. Um, the stunt double and I got cut up. But um, um, what I wanted to stress here was that it seems easy. I mean, or some of the things we do to people seem easy. But, I mean, they're just mistakes like that, you know, that you really, you really, um, you really earn your money. <laughs> Jumping a horse through a plate glass window, really, I earn oh, your money. Oh, well, you <laughs> mentioned the word money, and I'm sure that some of the young people who might be interested will say, well, I'm good at bicycles, I'm good at horseback riding, or any sports, probably wonder, is it well paid? It's, it's, it's a very lucrative job. The, the pay scale is pretty darn good, yes. But the risks? Um, you, get, you get paid for the risk you take. I mean, that's, that's our job. I mean, um, some of the jobs we do seem easy, and a good percentage of them just um, basically have to do with your talent. But a good portion of the jobs, it's, it's the risk that's involved. And um, you never know what's going to happen to you. I mean, we've had serious accidents, and we've had death that resulted in stunts. So mm -hmm. um, you you work for what you get paid for. All right. What would you say a young person who might be interested in uh, doing stunt work should do to prepare themselves? Um, well, to any young people, I would suggest to them that they prepare their, themselves with talents that they could use in the business. Um, I would suggest that when they decide that they want to be a stunt person, they learn some type of physical discipline whether it be gymnastics, swimming, diving, dance, martial arts, something that can give them a good sense of their body. Um, I would suggest that they learn vehicles, motorcycles. Um, I would suggest that they probably attend a high-performance driving school for automobiles. Um, I would suggest... What is a high-performance? Um, I've never heard of that. There, uh, there are schools, one in particular, um, it's called Bob Bondurant, and they, like, teach... Um, um, uh, different maneuvers in cars, safety, um, uh, um, like like doing a 360 yeah, they or teach roll the, over. Or yeah, really. They teach that. Well, is it, I went there. is it in Hollywood? Is it in Hollywood? No, he has. He used to be down here. He has since moved up north. I see. Um, but there's there's schools around that you know race car drivers go to. There's a lot of schools. And you that call those you. schools? I beg your pardon. How do you call those schools? You use a tech oh high performance driving schools. High performance driving schools. Never heard of it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I would suggest that they learn horses. Mm -hmm. I mean, any kind of talent that they can acquire before they come into the business um, will, will, will put them one step ahead of anybody else. They can just look at television and see what kind of action mm -hmm. is happening on TV. And if they can possibly learn it, learn it. Um, I would suggest that they take some film classes, uh, classes that, um, that um, target camera, because you're an asset to your director or your stunt coordinator, if you know what the camera sees, and I mean, has he, I mean, how the camera sees you as a performer. You just enhance the shot if you know what they can see. Um, I would suggest that uh, you know that you'll probably have to starve 
for a couple of years until you can establish yourself. So be prepared um, to take care of yourself, however it be, um, for a couple of years have until you have, have a job. The third thing is that I would suggest that anybody finish their education. I mean, I didn't, and sometimes I regret, regret not having um, finished my college education. Um, because sometimes the business isn't kind, and there's only so many jobs, and there's a whole lot of people. So someone would be smart to like get an education or um, uh, prepare themselves for a job outside of the business. Now, the the other thing which is difficult, f of course, for them is to let's say that they're all equipped. They're doing everything that you're talking about. They they stay in school. They learn about film. They learn about camera. They know all sorts of uh, physical action. Now they get here. How do they get a job? You were lucky enough because you were riding your horse and a gentleman saw you and said, I can use you. But how do they get a break? Um, right now, uh, most people entering the business now are going out and they're getting their composites made, which is um, pictures of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, a good head shot on the front, on the back, a full body shot, shots of any type of um, uh, physical action. things that you, can, that you can do. You put that together, then you start just going around and knocking on doors. You visit every set you can get to. You, you introduce yourself to every stunt coordinator in the business How that you can get to. How do they know the stunt coordinator? Um, Is there a, a stunt association for women and for men? Well, that they could contact? There, 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 are, there are three associations uh, of, um, of stunt men, a couple with women also mm -hmm. in their groups, and then there are two um, stunt associations for women. Um, they can, anybody wanting to get in the business, our association will send out a, um, a letter of introduction to the business and just tell you some key things about mm -hmm. what you should know. Um, and our organization is called the United Stunt Women's Association, and we're on Coanga Boulevard in Hollywood. And you know, we'd be glad to give anybody any, any information that you know they might request that we could supply them. Now, if, for example, could you recommend somebody if you like somebody and you saw some of their work, and you could you recommend? Is that how you get jobs? Well, basically. Once you get yourself working, that is how you get jobs. It's, it's mostly all word of mouth, and you know your your reputation follows you. Um, a stunt coordinator will will not know somebody to perform a certain job. They might not know of anybody who can do it, so he'll call other people he knows that um, he or she trusts, and um, ask them, "Do you know someone who can perform this job?" So it's all word of mouth, and we all kind of rely on each other in that way. Um, is there a specific uh, telephone that uh, deals only with stunt people? Um, we have an answering service that um, uh, most of the stunt people belong to. Um, it's been in effect for a very, very, very long time. Since um, recently, a, a couple other services have come into effect. So now in Hollywood, there used to be one, but now there's about three different services that most of the stunt people belong to, and you can always like call the service if all else fails and get somebody through the answering service. Oh, and then they call you, or the stunt, the stunt coordinator called and said, well, I would like to have JD, could you get in touch with her? Is that yes. how it works? Yes, I that's see. just about how it works. Really? Yeah. <laughs> all right, I have one picture here, which is gonna be very critical. Um, it's going to be difficult also for me to explain it, but I want you to watch this, please, because this is a picture in which JD was riding on a roller coaster, and the roller coaster hit a house right here. However, before the roller coaster jumped the track, JD and another person jumped from the from the roller coaster and there you are now you were told that there would be a sand trap at the bottom to cushion your fall yes can you explain to the audience what really happened in this mess right here uh, um 
Well, the sequence was a, um, uh, a, ro a roller coaster derailing from a roller coaster track. Um, so what we did was we set up um, a mock situation where we put the track up on top of the building, put the roller coaster up there, and you know shot the roller coaster off of the building. Um, we we use what we call catchers to catch us. Um, you mean people that actually catch no, you? just um, uh, airbags oh, or I catchers see, boxes, see, something that will, will will break your fall. Uh -huh. um, what they what they gave us as a catcher was digging up sand and sort of making it soft. Oh, I see. Um, we had to jump probably, we jumped down probably about 17 to 20 feet, and we had to clear a walkway of about 15 feet. So, like, we really had to propel ourselves off of this roller coaster. Um, when I hit the ground, I broke my back. The other gentleman that was a little higher than me, he split his pelvis. Now, the, the, what I want to stress here is that I mean, I hurt myself, he hurt myself, but, you know, it's the performer's responsibility also. To check. To check and to know. You. Right. Or, and to know, they gave, they pro I mean, they told me they were digging up the sand, but also the performer has to know that this is not something that's going to save my fall and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have to, to wrap up. Um, I would like to thank J.D., who is now becoming a producer, so she won't get hurt as much, for sharing her experience and her expertise with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Remember, you people out there, please keep watching us, because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Till next time.